Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones coming to you with another video and a year ago at this time I did a four-part series on roofs dealing with spray foam insulation and it occurred to me just recently that we need to do the same thing but this time apply it to walls. So welcome to an up-and-coming four-part series on everything to do with walls and closed cell spray foam. We'll we'll deal a little bit with open cell foam towards the end, but I'm going to answer the majority of the time of the questions and the subjects on closed cell. So the four parts are going to be broken out as follows. Part one, which this is, is going to be two by fours, right from the old school 1700s, 1800s, all the way up until the uh, end of the 1970s. Part number two is going to be the modern era of 2x6 construction that in most cases is still going on today. And then uh, part three will be the structural benefits of closed cell foam, dealing with air leakage and the air leakage studies that are out there and what design ease the closed cell foam or open cell foam can offer. And then part four, I think we'll rehash some popular... Um, topics of flash and bat sound using four and five inches of closed cell why don't we fill the wall up we'll take another stab at open cell foam at that point if there's anything left to talk about in that and then the big thing I think we need to address is pole buildings and the interest in pole buildings versus traditional framing because I'm getting a lot of questions from you that are wanting to build pole buildings but you're wanting to engraft a lot of well traditional framing designs into them and I think that that fourth video is going to be really really helpful so each step along the way we'll try and address everything with a little bit of open and closed cell foam but it's primarily going to be a closed cell foam video so strap in because I aim to try and hit as many of the high points as possible the 2x4 structure is the most common framing of dimensional squared lumber in construction history because it, 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 it spans the greatest amount of time from basically the uh, 1800s all the way through to the late 1970s. Some American states might still be using 2x4 as a code compliant wall assembly. Here in Canada it hasn't been code since um, early 1980s and that's due to thermal envelope decisions not over structure. Man's ability to figure out structurally what he needs has been far more advanced than man's ability to figure out what's going on with thermal um, loss in the building. In fact, a lot of our uh, 17 or 18th century homes uh, didn't have any insulation in them. They were hollow cavities. Uh, even throughout the 1800s, did they not use insulation until the later 1800s, until they started seeing that they were having so much heat loss, burning so much more wood and coal, the, the structures were cold, they were wet, and that if they put some sort of a filler material in walls and roofs, whether it be horsehair or sawdust or wood chips or hay or straw, that they had a better insulating ability in these dimensional uh, structures. So it isn't until the 1930s that fiberglass insulation uh, a pre-manufactured product that could be readily available to the construction community by Owens Corning was developed. How to insulate a wall structure with this new fibrous product that Owens Corning was manufacturing was largely trial and error from 1932 forward. It was like, okay, we've got this product, let's stuff it into these wall cavities, right, that will fix it. Well, no, not entirely, it didn't. Uh, it was stuffed into the walls. Wall cavities were starting to become routinely dimensional with 16 on center spacing, 24 on center spacing. So the, the fibrous industry could respond with making prefabricated uh, either roll products that would be cut to fit or dimensionally ready to go take them out of the bag like we have today. It wasn't until the 1950s that we started to realize in wall assemblies that we were having water problems. I mean, it's trying to figure that out, both in Canada and the U.S., and started to figure out that, all right, air is a problem or water is a problem. So if we stop water vapor from going through the wall, then we must stop our water problems, right? 
So in the end of the 1950s into the 1960s in Canada, and in I think probably more of the northern uh, United States where they have the colder weather climates, you started to see from 1960 forward some type of plastic polyethylene being used. Very thin film being placed uh, over top of the fibrous insulation and then the wall, drywall being installed after the fact. But they hadn't really figured out that it was more than water vapor. It's the big culprit is air leakage. If you do not stop the air from leaking through the wall, it really doesn't matter about water vapor. So you might say, well, what do you mean? Well, I covered this in a video uh, that I did a little while ago called, do we need a vapor barrier with open or closed cell spray foam? And in that video, I describe and show you that 98% of the water that's in a wall assembly is carried through air leakage. So the water is in a vapor format, relative humidity. Uh, and as it goes through the wall, it leaks through a hole. And then when it touches something cold enough that it can condense on, there you go. There's your unlimited amount of water. And that through a uh, two millimeter by two millimeter hole in a span of one building season, you can have 30 liters of water flowing through that hole, which is a drastic huge amount of water that's traveling in suspension in the air all through air leakage. So it isn't until in Canada that the... Uh, the vapor barrier idea shifts to now we need to incorporate what we call an air barrier. We're more interested in stopping the air. So we're not going to be some thin little piece of film. We're going to go to a thicker piece of plastic that can handle flexing and movement and twisting and, and what have you. But the problem has never been solved. Not from 1960, not from 1970s, not 1980s, and certainly not the 1990s and 2000s. The problem has never gone away, which is water in a wall is detrimental to the wall assembly. It gets the fibrous products wet. Once they become wet, they become useless. So if you take a paperback bat like you had in the 1940s, in the 1950s, uh, there's no air seal there. There's nothing preventing the air, which carries water with it, to go around the bat. You take the bat, you put it into the space, maybe you have a little nailing fin or stapling fin, you staple it to the edge of the 2x4 and that's it, you walk away. Well, that is just going to be a filter that is going to hold the water vapor uh, up between the fibrous material and the cold outside. Unless you are stopping the air from traveling through and coming in contact with a cold enough surface to condense, you're going to have a water problem. Now in the older buildings, the air leakage rates were so high and the heat loss rate was so high that the buildings were allowed to uh, rapidly expel the air with the moisture out of the structure and the structure stayed relatively dry. This is why we've opened up uh, 1947, 1957, 1967 walls uh, and they are dry and they are fairly uh, not damaged because the heat loss rate was so high. Although I've been dealing with a lot of people in the last 15 years of business that have told me I've been in this house for quite some time and it's only been in the last few uh, years that we just can't stand to be here anymore. Uh, the walls are wet. Uh, we're having condensation issues. What are we doing? You know, we literally have mold growing on the inside of the house. The answer is there's been so much air leakage for so long with higher humidity and more people living in the house uh, that they are now getting the bat wet repeatedly it's not being able to dry out and as a result it's uh, staying wet and once it gets wet the insulation value goes down to next to zero and the heat loss rates go up the condensation rates go up and now you've got this continuously wet state and we're going to be doing a, um, a project here coming up where we're going to try and detail it out for you where a family's going through exactly that high humidity and two by four walls 1957 built paperback bats and everything's damp and wet and they need to retrofit the situation. So this is why the fibrous industry and the insulation industry through 40 and even 50 years of time in 2x4 walls have not been able to solve this problem and they don't really truly understand it that it is an air leakage issue and that unless they stop the air. Now if you go and put poly up and then you go and put sheetrock up you increase your air leakage rate by 400% as soon as you put the screws through it. So don't think that putting poly and tape and acoustical sealant is going to solve the problem because that's only temporary until you punch it full of holes. 
So this is where the closed cell foam enters into. When we're doing a retrofit on a 2x4 system, 1940s built, 1930s built, 1960s built, doesn't matter, it's all the same. What we are bringing to the game is an adhering cellular plastic that adheres to the 2x4s and the board insulation or the plywood insulation. It fills all the gaps and all the crevices and it gets in behind electrical outlets. It gets into oddball corners. We can either drill holes to inject it or we can open structure up. But now we're adhered and becoming a structural element of the outside wall. We become structurally a laminated component within the wall assembly and then we can caulk the remaining seams of wood meeting wood around windows, around headers, around double plates, top and bottom, uh, you name it, on wall assemblies. And that stops the air from going through the seams. And then there's no air, zero air, going through the actual cellular foam and none going around or beside it between the stud. Okay. So all of a sudden now you have a monolithic laminated structure of cellular urethane plastic. And no, you don't need additional poly with poly. Make sense? Here's a typical scenario of uh, a retrofit paperback bat in the center here. It's hard to see with the, the polyethylene over it, but we have a 2x4 wall. This house, this structure was built in the 1950s, early 1950s, pre-55, uh, I believe. It's like 1951 or something. Uh, we got paperback bats stuffed into the walls. They don't even take up the full uh, three and a half inch space. And then at some time in the 1960s or 1970s, uh, there would have been a retrofit done about the time that they started to understand uh, that polyethylene vapor barrier was needed to control water vapor. They were just trying to control water. They hadn't figured out yet that the real issue was air leakage. So they've got a fairly th uh, thin film of plastic. Now you're sitting here seeing this in the exact state after the drywall uh, is pulled off. There's no acoustical sealant. Uh, there's nothing around where the base would be. It's not tucked in. There's no tape back then. So it was just a, a sheet of plastic would have been put up. It would have been stapled into place and uh, the wall assembly would have had the drywall put on. And this is a uh, good example of just air leakage within the wall assembly. Here you'll see uh, with everything gutted out, this area where the electrical outlet was was more wet, more damp. The air leakage rate is much higher at these penetrations here. So you're going to have a higher moisture source rate coming into the wall assembly and the wall cannot get rid of it. Whereas in the middle here, plywood, very rare to see plywood on this age of a 2x4 wall. Uh, but the wetting factor of the air leakage, air moving through the wall, condensing or, or being dispelled, is not making the wall get wet as quickly as, um, and as constant. So this situation, these 2x4 walls are going to be retrofitted with 2 inches of closed cell foam. And then all these seams, you hear me talking about the seams, all these vertical, these triples, the bottom plate, the double tops around the windows, it's all going to be caulked so that no air can escape through these seams. And then you're going to have an, a total wall assembly. And on the next image that I show you here, we're going to take a look at the thermal imaging camera to show just how well it's working. Okay, here's the composite. We have a 2x4 wall assembly. The wall assembly is 19, early 1950s built, paperback bats, uh, images of the poly vapor barrier retrofit from the 60s that I was showing you before. That's all been gutted out. I showed you the previous image where the walls that were gutted had uh, air leakage water damage on certain spots. And uh, we've installed two inches of closed cell spray foam into the walls, done the caulking uh, air seal package. Now. The housing authority here is using their little gizmo that they've recently got, Boys With Toys, and they've got a FLIR attachment on an iPhone 8 or 10, and they're going to walk around and they're going to just do a quick check of how the wall assembly is behaving. Now, the external temperature of the day, I was personally there, I'm recording this with my iPhone, it's minus 20 Celsius outside and they have got the inside of these houses cranked like they just turned the thermostat up they're not drywalled yet it's got to be about 23 degrees celsius and there was so hot we couldn't keep our jackets on so they're now just going to scan around they're checking things and a couple of things that we want to know just take a look at how even inconsistent the temperature is 
of the surface of the spray foam and how difficult it is on the FLIR camera, you can even see it in this image right now, how difficult it is to see the studs. Now, I've said this many times before and people will ask this, should we be referring the 2x6 or 2x4 wall out to 2x6? The answer is no. The answer is no because we only want to put two, two and a half inches of closed cell foam. We don't need to go three because you're going to see here in a few minutes just how powerful and good two inches of foam is working. So there's no need to go to three inches of foam and then have to shave. And there's no need to fur the wall out to a two by six and put three or four or even five inches of closed cell foam because two inches is doing its job. So you end the discussion on having to increase the wall thickness and change the footprint of the space and incur thousands of dollars of extra furring costs when you can retrofit it with two inches of close cell. That's the exact spec that was written here. They came to me, they asked me on this project, what would you do? Oh, it's a two by four wall. I said, that's no big deal. Two inches of closed cell foam. They said, will that work? Absolutely. They reviewed the same data that you people watching this video are reviewing and they made the same decision as you are. All right, two inches of closed cell foam. Now let's see how it's working. You're going to see that you can hardly see the two by fours. If they were super, super cold, if they were such a good conductor of heat and were so cold to the outside, or, or transmitting heat to the outside, we would be seeing a much cooler temperature uh, than what we're seeing right now. So I'm just going to let this video play for a few, just a few seconds here, and I'm going to hit pause and keep talking. All right? So he's scanning. Okay. Over here we've got we've got the far corner of the building. We have the window here. Okay. Around the window they have their retrofit uh, jam extension they have changed the dimensions they can't get the exact same dimensions of window so they have retrofitted with some extra blocking around the window that's what we're seeing that blocking has not been fully caulked yet so you're seeing the cold air leakage coming in it's showing only up at 22 degrees right this is a corner of the wall okay and here you can see a stud you can see a stud you can see a stud a guy's walking in front so here's the composite of the wall assembly I'll uh, wait till he goes over to the... Okay, so there's the wall assembly, right? Two by four, two inches of closed cell foam, right? King stud going beside the window. You can see uh, how they've placed uh, additional pieces in to change the window dimension, and he's now going to check the temperature. Now, again, you do not see ultra blue cool with the studs, right? Minus 20 degrees Celsius outside, okay? So here's our window header. Our header is hollow. Whatever was placed in there in the 1950s is still in there. The headers were not opened up and not changed. They were left in place. All they have is what's in them, and they're caulked and air sealed. So again, my argument, the headers are showing up at significantly cooler temperatures than the surface of the spray foam. Here we have a hot air duct. You can see how warm it is, right? Here we have the joist stand. Here's the floor joist. Here's the spray foam up in the joist stand, right? Here's the space above. If the stud faces were such a better conductor of heat and much, much colder, we would be seeing a much cooler temperature here. And there's our wall assembly, right? Here's the header. Here's the spray foam. Here's where they've changed the window. They need to fill that in with can foam and caulk it. That's what they're just checking. They're checking to see. And you can see just how well the air leakage is or isn't working. You're not seeing air leakage come from that blue uh, silicone seal sealant that we're using. Minus 20 outside. All right, so I'm just going to go back here. Go back to where he was. Again, there we are. There's the image. I mean, hot air is dropping down from an overhead vent and it's 27 degrees. 27 degrees Celsius, you know, the furnace is just running. So, you know, there's a really good image. Let's go back a second here. I mean, you can see the studs in the image. There's the header, right, above the window. Cold air coming in. The studs are not showing ultra cold temperature. Two inches of closed cell foam, minus 20 outside. We got 27 degrees. So, to put it in perspective, you got 27 uh, degrees on the surface of spray foam, and two, two and a half inches away, you've got minus 20. Right. 
So I think that shows perfectly how well the closed cell foam operates. So on the 2x4 walls, we're not seeing uh, the thermal bridging to be quite as aggressive as a problem as we would think. Um, I know that's a can of worms for most people, but I'm just not seeing it in the thermal imaging that we've done. I uh, just saw the video there where uh, the housing authority is going and checking out 2x4s. The situation is that the closed cell foam at 2 inches thick is plenty warm enough. Uh, when only two inches is separating it between a plus 20 environment and a minus 20 environment externally. I think that's enough. That shows you that three inches is definitely not needed. Therefore, why go to all the expense and time and effort of shaving? Why go to the expense, time and effort to fur things out? Vapor barriers are not used with polyurethane closed cell foam when we do the caulking package. And for those of you that are in the southern climates with two by four walls, if you were to be doing a vapor barrier, it wouldn't be on the outside, it would be on the, or in the inside, it would be on the outside. So, uh, with the closed cell foam, the vapor barrier is always, always on the correct side. Because the vapor permeance of the product is the vapor barrier, not the skin. And I go over that in, is spray foam a vapor barrier? I go over old retrofit buildings. I have a video dedicated to old structures as well, if you're, if you're wanting to see that. So with a vapor barrier on the outside, the closed cell foam is always placing it on the correct side. Whether you're in an air conditioning scenario in the summertime or you're on a um, uh, heat load situation on the wintertime, heat flow and vapor flow is always from hot to cold. So if you're hot outside, it's going to go to the inside. And if you're warm inside, it's going to the outside when you're uh, cold outside. So that's why I like the closed cell foam so much. Uh, open cell is good and there's a lot of excellent properties to it. If I had to retrofit and I couldn't get my hands on uh, closed cell, I'd use open cell foam. Uh, in the wetter, cooler uh, climates, you do need to be using, uh, especially when you cut the, the cell structure, you do need to be using a vapor barrier with it. I have a dedicated video on the vapor barrier issue. You can watch that. You can answer the question on what you should and shouldn't be doing with close or with open cell foam. The advantage that I like with the closed over the open on a two by four wall is that we're, we're getting that structural support out of the closed and we're getting a max ability of air and vapor control, whereas we're not getting vapor control with the open. And we're still using a polyethylene vapor barrier in the cold weather climates. Now, down in the southern U.S., you don't need to use a vapor barrier in some of your states. And why would you spend the money if you don't want the structural support? Open cell foam is going to offer you everything that you need thermally in the wall. It's going to give you better performance than you would ever get in um, glass. And the reason being is that even though it's an open cell product, you're not having air going through the cells from inside to outside and throughout the assembly. So you're removing convection air current within the wall stud cavity and you're not getting that um, rapid heat loss and transfer expansion uh, that you get with a fiberglass system. When you're dealing with old homes and balloon construction, closed cell foam makes perfect sense where you've got 16, 18, 12 foot long uh, dimensional squared lumber. We don't see lumber that long anymore. It hasn't been that way for uh, 75 years, but when you have uh, a two by four that's going to go all the way from the floor all the way to the roof then yes you are going to want to use closed cell foam for the structural support and the fact that you don't need to try to figure out how to get vapor barriers consistently up and down all of that distance of space so in sort of closing thoughts towards the two by four wall and use of closed cell foam the number one problem with a the 2x4 wall has been you can't get very much insulation into it of conventional mineral fiber or fibrous open cell fibrous that water vapor is always an issue and that we can instantly change the whole entire feel and use of the space with a closed cell foam instantly we have got more insulation value we've seen just how powerful two inches of closed cell foam is it's not the same old r value game it is a BTU retention and that two inches of foam can go through any winter that North America can throw at it and the same would be said for any uh, hot weather Texas, Arizona, Nevada uh, summer that Florida can throw at it. 
So we know that the BTU retention is there. We know that on retrofits from 1879 forward, the closed cell foam is not going to do damage to the interior space of the structure because to destroy antique siding or antique boards means that water is being trapped inside the wall. The closed cell foam displaces that. No air goes through it. No water goes through it. When a caulking package is added to this for the seams and joints, you now have an airtight, watertight wall. Then water is not going to be making its way through, condensing and bringing with it building degradation. So it is the absolute perfect decision for retrofits where you're concerned about water. Water to the outside of the building is always going to be a constant, but it's the interior side of vapor drive that you want to control, and that is controlled with closed cell foam. You can do it somewhat with open cell. Uh, the water uh, flow rate on an open cell product is much better than anything that you would see with a mineral fiber or a uh, fiberglass structure. With balloon construction, You've got a real winner in the closed cell foam, adding structural rigidity and bringing vapor and air control to oddball spaces, stairwells, and two-story, three-story homes where the lumber is continuous from a f ground level all the way to roof level. So you've got an 18 or a 16 foot continuous piece. Now, how are you going to get air and vapor control in between floor joist connections and other details that are odd? Well, if you can get closed cell foam into it, you've got a one-stop solution with that. So it's very, very favorable that way. So using the 2x4 system with closed cell means you do not need to fur out. You do not need to be thinking about filling this wall up to 3 inches and shaving it flush or greater than. 2 inches is more than sufficient. We've seen that with the thermography study. We've seen that with just real-world practical examples that you now have structural support and air and water control and a very very warm wall one that can go through some extreme climate conditions retrofit situations are still very capable if you have a building that you cannot be removing uh, the interiors off you can you can spray it from the outside and that's where you exclusively want to go with closed cell because you have got uh, the vapor barrier on the correct side the the vapor permeance of the actual product is providing your protection and then if you get uh, a retrofit where you've removed siding or strapped it out and you've added spray foam to the outside of the building and you do have rain on it, it's not going to ruin it. It's not going to soak any water up. It's not going to cause any damage. So this is a very good way to go. And we've done a number of structures where interior-wise there was just no practicality in, in ripping apart the home. If I have a choice, interior is the way to go just because we're out of the weather, out of the elements but not everybody is capable and able to do that. So you do still have options with the closed cell product. So I think the modern as tomorrow solution of two pound closed cell foam on a two by four wall is a perfect uh, match in heaven. If you really wanted to get extreme, you can go and put a little bit of rigid insulation on the outside of your wall and then add, still add the two inches of foam. And we're going to get into that when I start talking about doing uh, hybrid systems, inboard, outboard insulation on a two by six wall and what are the advantages to that. But when, you, when you're limited on space with a two by four, wire it out, put your wiring in, put your plumbing in, get all of your, your penetrations through, any outside plugs, get all your modifications done, get your plumbing done and then get your, your closed cell foam sprayed in then do your caulking package on your wood to wood joints even if you're in hot weather climate do your caulking package so that you're not wasting conditioned air leaking out like a sieve through easy to seal joints you want to make sure that whatever you've paid to condition is being staying in the space at your discretion not at the elements discretion so it's a pretty much a no-brainer on this. I'm not going to go into heavy science. We'll get into a little bit more isometric details on the 2x6 walls, where caulking is to go, where spray foam is going to go. Do we do 2-inch? Do we do 3-inch? Do we do 4-inch? So on and so forth. We're going to get into all of that sort of stuff on the next video. So stick around. Lay out a comment on this one. I want to know what you think. What did I not cover? What uh, should be added in addition? And we are going to catch you on parts 2, 3, and 4 probably be doing one video a week over the next month to catch you up to speed on this great and interesting topic. So thank you for subscribing. Thank you for staying this long if you did, and we'll see you soon on the next one. Bye.